Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people recorded in my trees. Episode 90. Part 3. Was Jack the Ripper in Australia? Warning, there is graphic information contained in this episode. This episode is going to cover the events that take place now that Frederick D. Ming and his new wife, Emily Mather, have arrived in Melbourne, Australia. On the 16th of December 1891, Deeming rented a house under the name of Ruin at 57 Andrew Street, Windsor. He rented it for a week on the 16th and then for a second week on the 23rd. He then paid rent for a further term of four weeks on the 30th of December. And on the 18th of December 1891, Ward, a cutler of Swanston Street, stated that a man whom they positively identified later as Deeming came into their shop and bought a pair of nail scissors. They particularly noticed him because of his arrogant manners and his profuse display of diamond jewellery and also observed that he was accompanied by a woman of a sad expression and quiet manners who seemed to be afraid of him. Two or three days later, he came in again with a pair of surgical dissecting knives, which he wanted cleaned and sharpened. Each had a pointed blade of about four or five inches long and was fitted with a crossbarred handle. They were badly stained, in some parts bore actual cakes and clots of hardened and coagulated blood. The cutler drew attention to their condition, whereupon Deeming replied, That's not blood, the stains are caused by lemon juice. The knives have been used during a sea voyage to cut fruit with. Although this was a palpable lie, the cutler took the knives and handed them to a workman to put in order. The man who received them was so struck with their appearance that he made the remark, My word, these knives have seen some work. They seem regular Jack the Rippers. About a week before Christmas, Mr McHale of Richmond said that a lady, petite in figure and gentle and refined in manner, sought to rent a furnished cottage from him. He had one, the terms of which appeared to meet her approval. When he asked her for references as to character, she replied she was not able to give any because she just arrived from England by the Kaiser Willem and had no friends in the colony. She then volunteered the statement that she had a difference with her husband and had resolved to return to England in the course of a few months after she had seen a little of Melbourne. She had saved enough money to pay for her maintenance here and her passage home. Mr McHale accepted this explanation and waived his objection to her renting the cottage without references, but she did not decide on taking the cottage at once. He saw her in Swanston Street afterwards and asked her if she'd made up her mind about renting the cottage and she replied, oh yes, I would take it almost immediately. Mr McHale then offered to place more furniture in the house, but she said that it was unnecessary as she would only have a few lady visitors who had been fellow passengers. Just as she had ceased speaking, Mr McHale noticed a man approaching, his face wearing an angry scowl. When the lady noticed him, she started nervously and then walked away with the man up Collins Street. Mr McHale took particular notice of the man and had no difficulty in identifying the portrait of Deeming later as that of the man. He never saw the woman again. It is supposed that Deeming induced her to proceed with him to the house at Windsor. He then purchased cement from John Woods at High Street in St Kilda. And then on the 19th of December, he engaged Featherstone to remove luggage from Wrigley's store to the Windsor house under the name Mr Willows. On the 20th of December 1891, he went to the Hamburg Laundry and asked about washing. On the 23rd of December 1891, he sent washing to the laundry. And this is around the time that it is believed that he murdered his wife, Emily, and buried her under the fireplace. The sharpened knives that Deeming had collected on the 20th of December were never found, and it was presumed after the fact that they were the weapons that were used on Emily Williams to meet her death. And how did he commit the crime? Well, it's said that he induced his wife to strip and bath. And while the poor woman was in the bath in a nude state, he gave her a blow with an instrument that stunned her. He then cut her throat in the bath, washing the blood away by turning the taps full on. He then dragged the body to a rough grave that he had prepared. On the 26th of December 1891, the washing had been returned to the house. And then in the week from the 21st to the 28th of December 1891, 
He introduced himself to Kilpatrick and Co. Jewelers of Collins Street as Mr. Dawson, a well-to-do Queensland squatter. He obtained a ring valued at £35 under false pretenses and he stole two other rings. He defrauded several others with whom he became acquainted with under the name of Dawson, one friend being duped for as much as £25. He was spotted at Bendigo selling jewellery. He gave the name of Williams and was about Bendigo from the 21st of December to the 28th of December. He placed a large quantity of ladies' jewellery, including rings, bracelets and watches, in the hands of Mr George Hobson for sale and stayed at the Royal Hotel for eight days. Mr Hobson sold six pounds worth of the jewellery, but Williams boasted to the landlord that he'd sold them for 200 pounds. He also told Mr Hobson that in February he would bring up £1,000 worth of jewellery for sale, but it never came. The jewellery was of good quality, but the vendor placed a low reserve on his goods. And Mrs Mather received a letter from Deeming that had been written on the 28th of December 1891 from Melbourne and posted on the 29th, saying his wife was enjoying herself and that they intended to sail on the 4th of January 1892 to Hong Kong on the steamer Catherine as he got an engagement with Gibbs Bright & Co of Hong Kong. On the 31st of December, he was spotted in sail. It says the consignment note of goods brought to sail by Dobson at the end of December shows him to be identical with Williams. The note returning the goods to Melbourne bears the date of the 31st of December, Sender, Baron Dobson, address sale, B. Dobson, Melbourne. It contained two hampers, one case, one basket, two trunks, one bundle and one keg. Capital letters D, K, H and C and the word Melbourne could easily be identified and these goods were delivered at Spencer Street. They were never removed from the station but they were reconsigned to Melbourne on the 31st. The railway clerk at sale received the freight from the consigner and he said that the consigner wore close cropped whiskers but otherwise considered that he resembles the portrait of Williams that had been published. He had appeared flush of money, pulling out 20 or 30 sovereigns when paying for the freight and a similar amount was paid for bringing the goods from Melbourne. Baron Dobson also wore a very handsome diamond pin and ring which he particularly noticed from the size of the stones. The trunks have the name Liverpool and known to be overland trunks. The hampers were long and flat, similar to those that are used on board ships for putting under bunks. The handle had an appearance of a bundle of pictures. The basket was a large ladies' dress basket and the keg apparently contained wine. The luggage was particularly noticed by the employers of the goods shed as seeing the word Baron on it, they were curious to discover if a real-life nobleman had suddenly appeared in sale. On the 2nd of January 1892, he was staying at the Cathedral Hotel in Swanson Street, Melbourne, and he registered as Mr F. Duncan. Deeming wrote an affectionate letter to Emily Mather's mother, and this had worked out to obviously be after Emily's murder. And part of what he wrote, he said, We have spent a happy Christmas. Emily is the happiest woman ever seen. She does enjoy herself. And this is around the time that a man in the earlier article, he mentioned how his daughter had spotted Deeming outside the Melbourne post office. Well, this was at that time. On the 5th of January 1892, he wrote to Holt's matrimonial agency under the surname Duncan, wanting to make an appointment for the following Saturday as he was wishing to meet a young lady with matrimonial intentions. So here is what he wrote to the matrimonial agent. From the Cathedral Hotel, Melbourne... 2nd of January 1892, matrimonial. The undersigned at the above address wishes to meet with a young lady with the above intentions. She must be good looking, aged 18 or 20 and know something of housekeeping. I myself am 32 years, engineer by trade. I have £360 in the bank and am about to enter into a good appointment. I am a sober, steady man I'm just from England and have had 14 years testimonials from one master. Please enclose photo of lady, yours F. Duncan. A letter acknowledging the receipt of this and advising Mr. Duncan that there were several good-looking ladies with the above intentions aged 18 or 20 who knew something of housekeeping on the books in the office and this was sent to him and he replied from Melbourne on the 5th of January 1892, Holtz Matrimonial Agency, 345 Swanston Street. 
Dear Sir, in answer to yours of the fourth instant, I will call you between 10 and 12 on Saturday next. Yours truly, F. Duncan. This promised visit was never paid, nor did Mr. Duncan make any apology or give any reason why he did not persevere in the search for a wife. On the 7th of January 1892, he sold through auction at Beauchamp Brothers in Little Collins Street, Melbourne, a quantity of articles, amongst were basket trunks marked with a large W, the lathe, canary and brass cage, a quantity of sheets, rugs, napkins, a couple of gold bracelets, pictures, two Indian swords and female wearing apparel. There was also a nightpan broom and spade that had been sold to Deeming prior and the man that had sold it to him could identify from those auctioned items the ones that he had sold him and that's how the police consequently worked out that Dawson was Williams. On the 11th of January 1892, he brought jewellery at Kilpatrick's in Melbourne as Henry Dawson and he befriended the Melbourne jeweller and then stole those items of jewellery. And also under the name of Dawson, he was well known to Mr Robert Goulet, who was a jeweller in Collins Street. It also mentions on the 11th of January, so a fortnight after the murder, that Deeming visited the Tower Hotel in Burwood Road, Auburn, which at that point was an outlying suburb of Melbourne. He ingratiated himself with the landlady, Miss Hurley, though she'd never seen him before. He told her stories of his wealth and a grand house and gardens in Sydney, but so far from persuading her to marry him, she says she told him he was a scoundrel and that she thought he was insane. He left the hotel shortly after his advances were roughly rejected. Next day, he left Sydney by the steamer Adelaide. He was expensively dressed and meticulously groomed, and on this ship he met the 19-year-old Miss Kate Ransville, using the name Baron Swanston. Two days later, he arrived at Sydney and stayed at the Wentworth Hotel in Churchill. And on the 27th of January, a lady who had met Deeming prior when he had his wife and two children living with him in Sydney said that he'd called upon her to renew his acquaintance with her and to ask how she had prospered since he'd seen her last. She naturally asked him about his travels and inquired after the health of his wife and children. He said he'd travelled in South Africa, South America and England since he last saw her and that his wife had died at Johannesburg. He added, I have just returned from England and I'm now staying at the Wentworth Hotel. I left my children with my sister at Liverpool. And one of the passengers on the Kaiser William II, that is Robert Frith, a sea captain, he also saw Williams in Sydney near the Customs House at this time. He spoke to him and asked him where his wife was and he replied, at our lodgings, but gave no address. He was accompanied by a fair young woman at this time and she was a stranger to Captain Firth and he was unable to supply any further description of her. On the 15th of January 1892, he went to Bathurst with Miss Ransville and stayed at Hurley's Royal Hotel and proposed to her. He told Ransville that if she agreed to become his wife, she would never regret it and would always congratulate herself on having entered into matrimony with him. After a whirlwind romance, during which Deeming gave Ransville several items of what was later known to be the stolen Melbourne jewellery, Ransfell consented to marry Aaron Swanston, as he was calling himself at that time. And after he was captured, Kate Ransfell made a statement and she said, I sailed on the SS Adelaide. It came via Melbourne, en route for Sydney, and after we had been a short time at sea after leaving Melbourne, I was suffering. The accused was very attentive. An acquaintance was formed between us. During the voyage, the accused told me his name was Baron Swanston. He was an engineer and he'd come from England. He asked me where I was going and I told him Bathurst. He asked me if I would allow him to accompany me. On arriving at Sydney, being tired, I determined to stay a night in Sydney and proceed the following day to Bathurst. I did so and the Central Coffee Palace being full, I stayed at the Wentworth Hotel till the following day when I continued my journey to Bathurst. He asked me if I minded him stopping at the same hotel in Sydney, and I said no. Whilst at Sydney, we went to Coogee, and he there proposed marriage to me and gave me a diamond and sapphire ring. He also lent me an opal brooch. I said I would wear it as the pin of my own was broken. Whilst on our way to Coogee, he met an elderly gentleman, and they stopped and spoke, and I walked on, and I did not hear what passed between them. I believe Captain Firth, who's the gentleman he spoke to. He rejoined me and told me the gentleman that he just left was a fellow passenger of his from England and very wealthy. 
Whilst on the train to Bathurst, I looked at a copy of the Sydney Morning Herald and seeing my name in the shipping news, I remarked to him, for once they've spelt my name correctly, but by the by, I don't see yours. And he said, oh, that is very probable. I booked on board. On arriving at Bathurst, I went to my sister's and he went to Hurley's Royal Hotel. He visited me again and proposed to me and I accepted his proposal of marriage, which on the advice of my sister, I accepted. He then made me a present of two diamond rings she had purchased from London from a young lady whom he intended to marry. After I accepted him, he told me that he had a quantity of ladies' clothing belonging to his sister, but I declined. He asked me if I liked riding, as he had a very nice riding whip which he had brought from South Africa. He sent me the whip, also gave me scent spray. During his visit at Bathurst, he decided to go to Western Australia, where he anticipated getting a good opening, and it was arranged that I would follow him and get married. He left Bathurst for Sydney on the 17th of January, and I received a letter dated on the 18th from Sydney, in which he refers to sending the whip to me. The next letter I received was on the 20th of January, another on the 23rd of January, in which he said he was leaving on that day on the SS Albany for Western Australia. The next letter was on the 8th of February from Perth, in which he asked me to send him the Sydney and Melbourne papers and that he got a billet for £6 per week as a managing engineer. The next letter was on the 15th of February, in which he stated he was leaving for the mine, go to Southern Cross, and gave me directions to join him. I have received various telegrams from him which I destroyed, a port being to join him. He telegraphed me £20 through the commercial bank in Bathurst, where I left on the 10th of March for Melbourne to catch the Oceania. But on arriving to Melbourne on the 11th of March, I saw the detectives and from what they told me, I remained in Melbourne. So just with his timeline, on the 21st of January, he returned to Sydney. He then left for Melbourne by train the next day. And then on the 23rd of January, he left Melbourne for Fremantle on the SS Albany. He called in at Adelaide en route to Western Australia and he complained that he had lost a dressing case on board the Albany. Mr Sinclair, the lawyer at Port Adelaide, to whom he applied, said, He struck me at the time as being a very willful and bouncing kind of man. He came into the office in a very airy and jaunty fashion, and though he came for the ostensible purpose of consulting me, he evidently wished to impress me with his superior knowledge of the law. He told me he had visited Adelaide during the morning and did not miss his bag containing his valuables until later in the day. It has been proved that Williams left Melbourne with the one dressing case, and that he had one when he arrived in Adelaide. It was considered hardly probable that a man would travel with two dressing cases. So the report of this extra dressing case was false. He was trying to claim one else's property. Captain H. Quinn, formerly harbour master at Port Adelaide, was a passenger by the Albany to Fremantle on the same trip. The tour reporter, Captain Quinn, said, I knew it was the same man when I received the description. I recollected him as a fellow passenger by the Albany when I took a trip in that vessel a few weeks ago. The fellow was characteristic in more ways than one, but as a growler and as a cantankerous man, he beat all that I ever met. Nothing was good enough for him. The ship, he said, was not fit to carry pigs. When he was not growling, he could be very pleasant, and on three occasions he got up. Ponsett was very jolly, doing most of the singing. He went on shore before breakfast when he got to Fremantle, and before noon returned to the ship a little the worse for drink and very talkative about some good position that had been offered to him. He told me it was an engineer to the railways at £6 per week, but I believe he told some others it was £9. After having a sleep, he left the vessel, and that was the last I saw of him. So says that Williams worked some time in Adelaide as a gas fitter and that he lived there in 1881 or 1882. It also says that he was sent to jail in Victoria. So, as mentioned, Baron Swanston, the name that he used for himself, he boasted his wealth, he boasted his position in society. He made approaches to Miss Maud Beach, a young woman in the care of her uncle and aunt, Mr and Mrs Wakeley. And in this case, Deeming's charm came to nothing, and Mr Wakeley told Swanston, I may tell you plainly that I don't believe your stories, and I'm not in the habit of allowing men of your class to enter my family circle. And on the 6th of February, when he arrived in Western Australia, he stayed at the Shamrock Hotel in Perth. And the very next day, he left for Southern Cross Yilgarn Goldfields to find work. And using forged testimonials, he obtained a position at a mine at Southern Cross. 
On the 8th of February 1892, once he settled at Southern Cross, he maintained a barrage of pleas to Ransfell, writing on the 8th of February, Don't keep me waiting, dear. If you love me half as much as I love you, you would not keep me waiting a day. While awaiting Kate Ransfell's arrival, Deeming procured two barrels of cement and used a portion of it to prepare a floor in one of the rooms. He sent to Fremantle some 70 miles away for this material and he was so eager to get it that he got it sent to Southern Cross by a special carrier at some expense. So, however, on the 3rd of March 1892, there was a discovery of a female body in a house in Windsor, Victoria. And this was the first time the deeming became known to the world as Albert Williams. Police were called to the home at 57 Andrew Street, Windsor, after a putrid smell was reported. John Stamford, a butcher who owned the Andrew Street property, had let the home to Deeming under that name Frederick Druin. And he complained to Mr Stamford that the walls of the house were full of nail holes and that he intended to repair them with cement. Several weeks later, Mr Stamford attended the property to collect overdue rent and he discovered the home was empty. He rented the property to new tenants, but they reported a vile smell emanating from the bedroom. Two police officers were sent to investigate the home and unearthed the decomposing body of Emily, who at that time was 30 years old, under the hearthstone of a bedroom fireplace. Her corpse was jammed inside a small cavity covered with cement. A post-mortem revealed that Mather's head had been fractured by a heavy object and her throat had been cut. The so on the 4th of March 1892, it was announced in the press ghastly crime at Windsor, a mysterious and sensational murder, a woman's body found buried in a fireplace, the murderer unknown. A crime more horrible and mysterious than perhaps any that has been chronicled in the colony for a long time was discovered yesterday at Windsor. A brick house in Andrew Street had been vacant for some time. Yesterday, a lady called to see the owner, Mr Stamford, butcher of High Street, to ask the terms of the place as she desired to rent it. He told her the amount of the rent and being satisfied thus far, she expressed a desire to be shown over the home. He complied and they were going through the rooms when the lady detected a strong odour of decaying matter and he passed it off, but his agent, subsequently finding it so fearful as to indicate that something must be wrong and traced it to a bedroom fireplace and sent for police. They opened up the fireplace and in a space of only two foot by 18 inches, found the nude body of a woman pulled together in a shocking manner and built in the masonry. It was apparent that murder had been committed, the skull had been smashed in, and it was also apparent the crime had remained hidden for over two months. About a week or so prior to Christmas, a tenant turned up in the person of a stranger who went to Mr Stanford and expressed a desire to rent the place. He gave no name, but his appearance was in his favour, and he declared his ability and willingness to pay rent in advance. The stranger went through the house and expressed himself in every way satisfied with it, except that it had been knocked about and he wanted plastering to be done here or there, such as in the picture nail holes. The bargain was at once struck and though he referred to the agent, he said that Mr Stanford could give him a receipt for the week's rent, which he paid in advance. Mr Stanford did so and took no further notice of the man that day. On the next day, however, he appeared at the butcher's shop again with a small paper bag in which he said he had cement to plaster up the holes that he complained of. Several days later, he went to the agent and said, I won't take that house after all. It's overrun with cockroaches. I'll pay you another week's rent in advance. However, as it is about due, you can take a week's notice. Up to this time, he had not taken any furniture into the house. And of this and other matters connected with it, Mr Stanford says... I could not make him out at all. He was a bit curious and made several statements. He told me he was an engineer's toolmaker who had been carrying on business in Sydney. He said, I am taking the house really before I want it because I haven't anyone to put in it as yet. I'm awaiting the arrival of a lady who is going to act as my housekeeper so I shan't fetch my furniture from Sydney until she arrives. On another occasion, he told the clerk in the employ of an agent that it was his sister who was going to act as his housekeeper. Before the expiry of the second week, for which he'd paid in advance, he went to the agent and paid for four further weeks more in advance. He was reminded jokingly of the cockroaches of which he had previously complained. He said, oh, that's all right. I think I can settle them.
I'll get something to kill them easily enough now that I come to think of it. He had a further conversation with me in which he said, I ought to make good tenant because I'm a practical man. You see, when anything goes wrong with the plaster or the fittings, I, being an engineer, can easily put it right. Mr Stanford described him and said he was a man of medium height, a fair complexion with a light moustache and beard, the latter being about an inch in length. He seemed a mild-mannered person, gentlemanly demeanour, tolerably well-dressed, and altogether a fairly prepossessing appearance. I could not have associated such a man with so cruel and detestable a crime. On reflection, he gave the impression of being a man with more than usually developed strength. Although seemingly slight in build, he had solid square shoulders, and with his erect stature gave one an idea of a reserve of strength that would have stood him well in any personal conflict. His age was about 40, while others who saw and spoke of him declared he was considerably under this age. Soon after he engaged the house, he placed a canary in a cage in front of the house, and except for the purpose of conveying a false impression that the house was tenanted, no other reasonable motive can be imagined. I might say that during the first part of his supposed tenancy, a Mr Alfred Spedding, a young man residing in the home adjoining 27 Andrew Street, saw a female in the company of the missing man. He described her as a woman somewhat under the height of her companion, somewhat showily dressed with light brown hair, approximately 35. On more than one occasion, he saw them both leave the house. This one fact stands clear that the murderer's intentions were deliberate. He had fully premeditated his crime, that he took every possible precaution to destroy the slightest clue that might lead to his apprehension, and fearing detection from the identification of the clothes of the murdered woman, was careful to take them away with him. It was noticeable then the fireplaces of every room in the house, letters and papers had been burnt. In the fireplace in the front room, an empty bottle was found and it was believed to contain a chemical fluid of some sort. It was also noted that other materials, in addition to letters and papers, had been burnt in all the fireplaces. The 6th of March, 1892, the suspect is established as the last occupant of the house as Albert Williams. The police then identify several aliases used by him. Investigators used luggage tags recovered from the property to trace the identity of Mr Druin to the Kaiser Wilhelm that arrived in Melbourne. The description of Mr Druin matched that of the passenger listed as Mr Albert Williams, accompanied by a woman named Emily, believed to be his wife. Passengers of the steamship reported that Mr Williams was loud and boastful, which led investigators to another character who had just boarded a vessel for Perth, Western Australia, on the 23rd of January, under the name Baron Swanston. Deeming's arrest came after detectives were drinking at Melbourne's Young and Jackson's pub and they overheard a wine merchant talking about a strange man that the merchant had met on a steamer on a trip to Perth. In the course of the investigation, those who remembered the Mrs Marie Williams in Rainhill recalled the wife as being nothing like the Emily Williams found dead at the house in Windsor. Marie Williams was older, shorter, with a much darker complexion. It appeared there'd been two Mrs Williamses. With Deeming safely locked up, awaiting extradition to Melbourne, the detectives set about trying to find the missing Deem- Mrs Deeming and the children. The only lead was an invitation found in the Dinham Villa to a dinner given by Albert Williams at the Commercial Hotel in Rainhill. Now believing that an Albert Williams may exist, the detectives, Considine and Causey, telegraphed the Lancashire Police, asking them to investigate the dinner. If possible, they wanted them to find Mr Williams and ask him if he could shed any light on Frederick Deeming's missing wife and young family. Local police inquiries led them to the Rainhill News Agency that was owned and operated by Mrs Mather, the mother of Emily Williams of Windsor, Victoria. She collapsed when told of her daughter's death. The discovery of five bodies on the 16th of March 1892 in Rainhill, England happened two weeks after the body of Emily Williams was found at the Windsor home, so it coincidentally mirrored identical circumstances, and this unearthed a monster and the true identity of Albert Williams. In the criminal trial, there was a statement from Louisa Atkinson, who says, I'm a washerwoman presiding at Windsor. On Christmas Eve, I passed Andrew Street. This was about 7pm. I heard a man and woman quarrelling in the house. I stopped and listened for a few minutes. I heard a crash and a woman ran out the back door 
and walked up and down the side entrance. She seemed excited. I said to her when she came to the front, if I were you, I would leave this place for a while. But the woman smiled and said, it'll be all right soon and went back into the house by the back door. I heard nothing more and left. So there was a coroner's inquest into Emily Mather's death and the jury concluded that Albert Williams, otherwise known as Frederick Bailing Deeming and otherwise named on the 25th day of December 1891 at Windsor in Melbourne, fractured the skull and cut the throat of Emily Williams, feloniously, willfully, and of his malice, Afer thought, killed and murdered the said Emily Williams. So as a result, a warrant was issued for his arrest, and that was issued on the 7th of March. There was a Victoria Police Gazette notice on the 9th of March, 1892, and it was it's probably the most detailed one that I've seen. Albert Williams in charge on warrant with the willful murder of his wife, Emily Williams, at 57 Andrew Street, Windsor, about the 24th of December. Description. Believed to be a native of Lancashire, England, 35 years of age, 5 foot 7 or 8 inches high, stout build, broad square shoulders, very slight stoop, fair, fresh complexion, fair hair inclined to brown, rather large ginger moustache only, speaks with a slight Lancashire accent, wears a grey tweed sack suit or blue serge coat and vest, lightish coloured trousers, black boxer hat or light grey or fawn coloured pocket felt hat, carries a silver mounted umbrella, wears a diamond collar stud and sometimes diamond studs in the front of the shirt, a double curb pattern Albert chain with square shaped locket with a diamond in the centre, a heavy gold hunting watch by Bennett Cheapside London, a rather large single stone diamond ring on the third finger of the right hand, sometimes wears a diamond scarf ring, one diamond in the centre surrounded by small ones, believed to be an engineer's toolmaker, but sometimes passes himself off as an engineer. He also has the appearance of a sailor and often talks of his travels to India and Africa. He may assume the names of Dawson, Watson, Druin or Willows. He was a passenger with the murdered woman by the steamer Kaiser Willem II, which arrived here on the 15th of December 1891. They stayed at the Federal Coffee Palace, Melbourne, till the 18th of December when he took her to 57 Andrew Street. The deceased body was found buried underneath the hearthstone there on the 3rd of March 1892 with her skull fractured and her throat cut. Later information states the offender occasionally carries an ebony walking stick with plain gold band formed out of a gold ring and mounted with a silver top plain polished. On Sunday, he usually wears a black fro- frock coat, patent leather boots with kid tops. He purchased in Melbourne a silver hunting chronograph, a pair of black mounted field glasses, a silver matchbox with a St. Bernard dog painted on one side, the other side plain, polished with initials, believed AL, engraved thereon, Jen's single stone diamond ring, gypsy setting in plain polished gold valued at £25, and a single stone diamond ring claw setting, the ring formed of three or four strands, carries a plain polished silver flask. There was also the notice that there was a reward of £100 for information that will lead to the arrest and conviction of Albert Williams. And a telegram was sent to Perth as the police got word that Williams was at the Southern Cross Goldfields working as a managing engineer. There was a series of telegrams that were sent and received by the West Australian Police. On the 10th of March 1892, it says, Age 35, arrived at Fremantle per the steamer Albany, went to Perth and stayed at the Shamrock Hotel on the 6th of February, carries a pair of pliers made from knitting needles, which he shows as specimens of work. He may assume any name, a very important case and a rest most desirable. While in Western Australia, he was described as being very vainglorious. He made no attempt to live quietly. He courted the society of everyone and was particularly notorious for lion and tiger stories. He had large quantities of luggage when he arrived at the Occidental Hotel in Fremantle. And on the 11th of March, Frederick Bailey Deeming was arrested at Fraser's Gold Mine in the mining town of Southern Cross, Western Australia, in the disguise of Baron Swanston. 
was in the Police Gazette on the 23rd of March 1892. Albert Williams, a man named Baron Swanston, has been arrested at Southern Cross, Western Australia, and has been fully identified as Albert Williams and charged with murder. In part four, I'm going to cover what happens after they extradite Frederick Deeming to Victoria and the trial that will ensue. If you are interested in sharing your story on my podcast, Family History Mysteries, please go to my Facebook page and send me a message. If you would like some assistance in filling in the gaps in your family tree to see what mysteries you solve, please get in touch. And don't forget you can have early access to episodes by subscribing and you'll also gain access to bonus episodes.